So we're in the book of Genesis. So it's not hard to find. It's not like having to turn to Hosea. Just turn to the first page in your Bible, unless you have some kind of extra notes or whatever, and you're there, right? Except we're in Genesis 3. And for those of you who think, man, at this parade, we'll probably have great grandkids before we get through the book of Genesis, we will pick up the pace. But the Genesis, the, the book of Genesis is a, is a history book, not a poetry book. It is the beginning of all that we know and all that exists outside of God, all the universe, the solar system, everything, uh, including us, including everything that you've ever seen, all began in time just as God said. And it began historically just as God said. And so really we got done with the book of Romans and we said it's the greatest book in the greatest book. And that's true. It seems that there is just so such a rich depth of what the gospel is in Romans. But really to understand that, you've got to understand Genesis, and especially Genesis 1 through 11. That's critical to understand everything else in the entirety of the Bible. You have to understand Genesis 1 through 11, because this is where it all began, this is where it all went haywire, this is what happened, and this is why, uh, why we are where we're at in hu- human history, and, and all the problems that we face, and all the difficulties with, uh, uh, that mankind is dealing with, it all can be traced back to the beginning. And so we're going to be looking at that today. In fact, we already have seen that God created the world in how many days? Six days, and then rested on the seventh, right? And, and so God created, in fact, the pinnacle of his creation, Robert Jackson, was mankind. So God created mankind as the pinnacle of his creation so that a mankind is under God and over, he takes dominion over, the rest of creation, right? But when you hit Chan, Rem, Genesis chapter 3, you run into the problem. So when we look at the world, you see a broken world. When you look at the world, you don't have to, uh, it doesn't have to be just the war in Ukraine, which is tragic. Uh, it can be all the sexual perversion that's considered normal. Uh, in fact, we're going to start a series for the equipping our men and women back together next week. And the premise of the book is, why would it, in this culture, why could a person say, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, and people understand it as normal, right? Well, it's because of depravity, because of sin, yes, but because so many things are going haywire in people's thinking, and it's so far different than what God had said, right? And so when you look at all the brokenness in the world, you don't have to be a Christian to understand it's broken. Everybody understands the world's broken. But you have to be a Christian to know how to fix it. Because while the world, everyone agrees the world's broken, everyone has a different fix for the problem. But there's only one fix. It's Jesus Christ. And to really understand why he's the only fix, you've got to go back to why it broke, how it broke, right? So if you took your car to the mechanic and you say, oh, this thing's not working right, I need it to be restored back to working right, they would start asking you some questions, right? Well, what was it doing when it broke? What noise is it making? What, you know, whatever. They're trying to diagnose to get it back to what it was like before it broke, right? Or if you went to the doctor, they're going to ask you questions. You're not feeling well and things are going wrong physically in your body. They're going to ask you, so when did this start? How did it start to feel? What, what's going wrong, right? They want to get you back to health. There was a time in human history where people were healthy in connection with God. In fact, everything was right in this world. And that time was back in Genesis 1 and 2. But as you hit Genesis chapter 3, we find out what went wrong in humanity. And so in order to understand how to fix it, we have to understand what broke. And so the garden, keep in mind, was, yes, a beautiful oasis, but it was more than just a beautiful oasis. It was actually an amazing place, a, a supernatural place, in that God actually in in a visible form, would show up and do what? Walked with mankind. God would show up in human form, or in a visible form. He didn't actually take on a form of a man until Jesus, but in a visible form, and walk and talk with Adam and Eve in the garden. In fact, it's such a supernatural place, it kind of, you know, if you, if you watch Marvel comics... Uh, but they, you know, you sort of have this gatekeeper over the nine realms, and people travel in between, and they come through this gate or whatever. And in fact, the, the garden was not only an, an oasis, it was where God met with people. But Satan also shows up in such a supernatural place that Satan, indwelling an animal, shows up and speaks to Eve, and she's not even freaked out about it. My wife's freaked out if she just sees a snake. 
Eve is listening to a snake talk to her and is not freaked out, right? And so you go, this is a, quite a supernatural time, right? Back when mankind was not broken, back before the fall, before the curse. So we pick up there today, and what we're going to see is Satan sounds kind, God is kind. Satan sounds kind, God is kind. You really, 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 you've got to know this. Satan sounds kind, God is kind. Because we live in a culture, and we're going to see today, why this all broke was because mankind believed that what Satan was saying was kind and that God wasn't. But in reality, Satan only sounds kind, God is kind. And everyone you're going to evangelize to, everyone you're going to share the good news about Christ to, is going to believe the opposite of what God says is actual kindness. When God himself is the only source of kindness. True kindness. So we pick up in in Genesis chapter 3. And verses 1 to 5, he says this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman... Now, I don't know how your wife would respond to an animal talking to her, let alone a snake talking to her, but Eve isn't bothered by this, right? Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the tree of the garden, we, from uh, the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat for in it, from it or touch it or you will die. Now, he didn't actually say touch it, right? But he did say eat it. The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not, what? Die. Die. Satan takes what God says, flips it around and says the exact opposite. Hmm. For God knows in the day that you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Knowing good and evil. You see, what happens is, Yes, this world is filled with plenty of people who just deny the word of God outright and anything God says. But there's other people who believe that the Bible is true and then go right along with Satan's reversal. So when God says it, they say, oh, actually he means this is my interpretation. And they say the opposite of what God says, which is exactly what Satan says. By the way, when Satan says, you surely will not die, and they ate, what they do? They died. This is a really important thing because some of the most uh, popular interpretations of the Bible are exactly the same type of interpretation that Satan was doing in the garden. And now they're wildly popular in Christianity. You see, nothing's really changed, has it? In fact, has God really said is sort of the the quintessential question now among Christianity. Has God really said? Has God really said? And you need to be careful. Is Satan still doing the same thing he was doing in the garden that broke mankind? Is he still doing that same thing? Has God really said? He's doing the exact same thing. In fact, a few examples. Uh, Sometime back, World Vision, a Christian ministry, decided to switch gears and saying they had been saying they have about 1,100 uh, staff with World Vision. And so the, the head of it said, well, we want to change our opinion. Uh, uh, people still, to, to work for this Christian ministry, uh, they still need to be married, but they can be married heterosexually or they can be married homosexual. It doesn't matter uh, because, uh, how did he put it? Uh, this is not compromise. It's about unity. That sounds nice, right? It sounds kind. It's not about compromise. It's about unity. Now, they had enough pushback that he, they ultimately reversed the decision back. But Satan sounds kind, God is kind. It sounds kind, doesn't it, to say, oh, you know, we're all Christian. Let's not, it's not compromise to say you can be homosexual or heterosexual. We're all Christian. It's really about unity. That's what's mo- most important. That sounds really kind, doesn't it? Or the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, which by their doing you realize evangelical is pretty much a useless term today. But the ELCA um, has uh, began at way back. They uh, put together a resolution in 1991 that uh, said that whether you're gay or lesbian or whatever, 
there should be no distinct distinctions among people in the church if they're gay or lesbian or or straight it didn't matter in fact by the year 2010 they ordain uh, practicing gay or lesbians um, as pastors and clergy in fact all the way back to um, it was in 1988 that the ELCA uh, started ordaining uh, women as pastors and really their whole goal by their own uh, acknowledgement is uh, inclusion right and tolerance inclusion and tolerance those terms sound very kind don't they In inclusion and tolerance and yet, if you read what the Lord says, this is interesting, because in 1 Corinthians 6, he says this, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Whenever he says, do not be deceived, why does he say that? Our temptation is to what? To be deceived, right? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of Jesus Christ and, and in the spirit of our God. So you say, wow. It's interesting because we live in a day that says a lot of kind words, right? Inclusion, unity. We wouldn't want to make any issue of some of these sexual perversions. In fact, we'd never call it that. And then you, you read these things from World Vision or the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America and then you read the Bible in 1 Corinthians 6, which one sounds more kind? To our culture, which one sounds more kind? This one sounds infinitely more kind. We just accept all things and all peoples, and then what? God comes along and says, neither effeminate nor homosexual and will inherit the kingdom of God. None of them are coming into my heaven. What does that sound like? That doesn't sound very kind, does it? Because what you'll find is Satan always sounds kind, but in fact, God is kind. Satan will always encourage you, and God will encourage you and speak kindly to the things that will restore you and redeem you and help you. In fact, for the ELCA back in 98, making that um, the, the lady pastors, and yet here's what he says, um, in First Timothy 2, a passage so inflammatory that I even know of a church locally that split just in uh, discussing this passage. But here's what he says. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly, discreetly, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women, making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction with tire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over her man. And so while women, Titus 2, are commanded to teach, and they're commanded to train, and they're commanded to pour into ladies so that their role is selective, and then the guys have a different role, and it's more collective, it's over all of it, that's very wildly unpopular. But you would have to admit that to our culture, the ELCA and the vast majority of Christians would, would find reinterpreting God's word to say the exact opposite, to be more, way more kind, wouldn't you? I would say this. God is offensive to the vast majority of Christians. And if you're like me, there's been things that I've read in the Bible, and I'm like, that's offensive. That can't be. But you would come back and you say, wait a minute. If I'm offended by something that God in His holiness and His kindness and His infinite goodness and mercy has done, I'm the one who's wrong, not God. You see, all the way back in Genesis, we find that the fall of man, which brought about the curse, that's the reason we have death. Every time that you've ever seen a funeral hearse go by, it's a validation of God's word, that what God said is true. All of the times, if you turn on the news and you see all the chaos and war and crime and all this stuff, it's validating that God's word is true. Every time you've struggled to say, man, how am I going to make a living? How am I get Everything seems to be fighting against me. God's word is true. In fact, all of these experiences, they don't deny a kind God. They validate him that exactly what he said is true. And so he, he says, 
you shall not, uh, oh, the, he says, the servant said to the woman, you surely will not die. God knows in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan actually spins it around to make it sound to Eve as though it would actually be a good thing doing the opposite of what God said. Oh, well, if you explain it that way, all of a sudden it's like, that makes sense. I was just misinterpreting. Satan's point is, um, if, if it seems like it's limiting your freedom, and if it seems like it's unkind, well, that couldn't possibly be from God. So Satan comes along and says, no, no, no. Do the opposite of what God's saying, and you'll have success. You'll find significance. You'll actually benefit from these things. Hmm. Hmm. So what you find is the demonic interpretation actually sounded very good to Eve. And it sounds very good to modern Christianity too. Think about how modern Christians would interpret that. God says, you can eat from any tree except that one. You can almost hear modern interpretation saying, God wouldn't say that. That would be legalistic, right? That would be legalistic. Not that one, but all these, that would be legalistic. Or you could almost hear them saying, I just interpret it differently. I believe God's about kindness and inclusion. I think he actually meant you can eat from all the trees. Can you hear Satan's voice in modern interpretations? Has God really said that? In fact... You can hear Satan's voice saying, well, that wouldn't be kind and that wouldn't affirm you. So if it's not kind, it couldn't be from God. Do people evaluate the word of God today based on their own perceptions of kindness as to whether it's truth? Yes. Which means the word's here and they're here. They judge the word. But God's word says it's here and you're here. It judges you. You see, you and I don't sit in judgment over the word. The word sits in judgment over us. But modern interpretation sounds just like Satan interpreting Scripture in the garden, right? A lot of modern interpretation is nothing more than demonic distortion. And for Eve, she learned a hard way, didn't she? You surely will not die. She ate and died. She died spiritually and ultimately died physically. You see, Satan came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But God says, I have come to give you life and life abundantly, right? In fact, I want to read in John 8.44, he says, You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. Remember, Jesus is making a statement, right? Does his statement sound kind at this point? A lot of things Jesus said, many things he did were really very kind, right? He cared for the poor. He helped and healed the sick. He raised the dead. Other things he did or said seemed to us to be unkind, like calling people uh, Satan. Satan. Thank you. That would seem to be unkind. Was it true? Was he rebuking them in a way to turn them away from folly? Yes. You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Be careful. What you'll find is you can turn on Christian TV programs all day long many of which that use demonic interpretations of God's word to say the exact opposite of what he said, to twist the scripture to say, this is really all about you, when actually it's really all about him. To say, this is really, a, he's kind of your genie, rather than you're his servant. Be careful. Satan loves to twist the Bible. That's why I encourage you, don't listen to what I'm saying. Go back and read these things for yourself and see what is going on here and see what is true. He says this in John 10. The thief, that's talking about Satan, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. You see, Satan sounds kind. God is kind. You need to know that because there's going to be times where what the word of God says about 
your position or what you're to be about or, or, or these things is going to sound unkind, but God is kind. And you need to know that. And so he goes on. And um, in fact, going along with what was said in Matthew 16, 21 to 23, do you remember Peter, the chief of the disciples, rebukes Jesus when Jesus talks about going to the cross? Peter says, no way, far be it from that. Not, not for you, Jesus. Did that sound kind? It would sound like he's like looking out for Jesus, saying, Jesus, no, that's not going to happen. You're not going to die. These things. Sounds kind. What does Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. Actually, had Jesus gone with Peter's idea and not gone to the cross, he would have just damned all mankind, which is exactly what Satan wanted. So what sounded appealing to Peter, and anytime you're rebuking Jesus, you should know that's probably not a safe ground, right? And yet many modern interpretations are nothing but rebuking Jesus as wrong because that's what Satan did all the way back in the garden. Be careful. Any of us can do this. Any of us can fall prey to this. Any of us can deceive ourselves into believing the opposite of what God says is actual kindness and truth rather than agreeing with God that what he's saying is true and is kind and is for the benefit and flourishing of mankind. So he goes on and says, verse 6, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and That the tree was desirable to make one wise, she starts looking at it, right? That does make sense. I would feel significant. That would be actually the opposite of what God says really would be kindness. It really would be great, right? Isn't that what she's coming to the conclusion of? She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. So the wife and the husband eat for two very different reasons. The wife is deceived into believing it's what? It's good. The husband is just your typical lazy, passive, rebellious guy. He's not of the opinion that it's good. He just goes along to get along, right? So the wife, being deceived, eats thinking it's good. Husband, he's just a bum. He just rebels against God. Can you tell some husbands... A lot of things that God says, and they don't do any of it. Yeah, just like Adam, right? Looks like Adam, right? But the problem is, throughout the rest of Scripture, we find these very things playing out. In fact, who gets harangued by this disobedience? Who gets held accountable for this disobedience throughout the rest of Scripture? Adam does. We talked about that for the guys this morning in the equipping hour. Adam had to own that. Because Adam should have stepped up and led in that. Adam should have been leading his wife to say, don't listen to Satan. He's twisted it. He's flipped it upside down. He's telling you to do the opposite of God. You need to do what God says and not what Satan's deceiving you into believing. Instead, he doesn't. And she goes along with it. And this is still playing out in the New Testament, as Paul tells Timothy. For it was, uh, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Who was deceived? The lady. This is so unpopular. Like, this is like getting up and taking your fingernails. You, know, you, you remember that back when they had chalkboards? Probably none of you were even alive when they had chalkboards, other than a few of us, right? Chalkboards. But, and you took your fingernails, and you just go right across it, right? What happens when you do that to a chalkboard with your fingernails right across it? Woo! Wakes everybody up, right? Pretty horrible noise, right? The fact is, God sounds so unkind to our culture that what God's saying almost sounds like putting your fingernails on a chalkboard and just screeching across it, right? How can we get to the point where God seems unkind and mankind and their demonic philosophies sound like kindness? We should ask those questions, right? Because we get shaped by culture. And if we're not careful and we're not prayerful and we're not in this and letting this be in us, we can start to feel like the world's actually telling us truth. We can actually start to feel like maybe God is holding out on us. Maybe God isn't so kind. Maybe God isn't so right. But God is always right. 
God is always kind. God is always truthful. God is always merciful. And God always has you and I's best interest at heart, right? Mm. But for the, for the guys, obviously no woman is going to look at a guy who sits on their second-hand or third-hand leather couch playing video games all day and go, wow, I want to marry that guy, right? There's like zero women in this world who want to marry that guy, right? But you think of a guy who goes to church, nice guy, works a job. You might tend to think, well, that guy surely knows his stuff. Do you know there is a huge problem, even among Christian men, of being passive-aggressive guys like Adam? Passive when it comes to anything significant or important. And aggressive when it's completely useless or worthless, right? What church should we go to? Oh, I don't care, honey. You decide. Oh, I'm going to have, uh, I got friends coming over. We're going to use the living room. Not while I'm doing football. Football doesn't matter at all. Video games, you should have hung up a long time ago if you're a guy, right? That's a stupid kid's game, right? The fact is, to not be the passive-aggressive guy, passive in all things that matter, and then aggressive. We are not paint, painting the hallway pink. I got to admit, that one would drive me nuts. But the, uh, it was a bad example. I wouldn't get angry. I just like, I don't know what. <laughs> My honey is, I don't even have to worry about it. She's real cool at this stuff. Uh, that was a bad example. But if you, if you think of, uh, you know, passive, aggressive guys, that's modern Christian dudes. That's modern Christian dudes. They're just like who? Adam in the garden. They're just like the kind of guy ladies should never marry. Yeah, they, they seem way better than the guy here sitting on his secondhand couch he got off Craigslist playing video games all day. But they're almost as useless. Because they're not leading their family. They're not loving their wife. They, instead of going, man, I'm just reading the word. I'm trying to just hear from God. They're not listening to their wife and understanding her concerns and being there to comfort and help and, and, and build up and encourage and protect and provide for them. They, they should be going to God. They should be loving their wife and listening to their wife and caring for the wife. They should be going to the word of God just go, man, what is God saying? What is God saying? They should be fasting and praying and they should be leading the charge so, so that a wife could say, man, what does it look like to reach out with the gospel to people? Oh, I can look at my husband. He does that. Oh, what does it look like to use your spiritual gifts? Oh, I can look at my husband. He does that. What does it look like to hunger for the word of God? Man, I can look at my husband. He does that. What does it look like to just be in prayer and seeing God answer prayers? Oh, I can look at my husband. He does that. He's not the passive guy, Adam. He's the active guy that is diligently out front in our family, knowing that we're in a spiritual battle every day, and he's leading and he's praying. That's not to diminish in any way the important roles, but different roles that ladies play. Just because of what played out in the garden may impact our different roles, but it doesn't diminish either. So that men have certain roles and women have distinct roles. And, and, and what we are about is winning the roles within the parameters that God has placed on us. And instead of interpreting like the world, man, there should be no parameters. In fact, they've gone so far as there should be no distinction, men or women. Which is playing out very poorly for women's sports, right? That are being dominated by men. And in time, there won't be a single woman who will ever win a women's sport. Why? Because God made them different. When God made the woman the weaker vessel, even if our culture says women should be kicking butt and taking names, God made us different. If you own those differences, you agree with God on those differences, you can actually own your masculinity or own your femininity, and you can win it in a way that's beautiful and pleases God. But if you agree with the culture, which is just totally haywire, you just end up in all kinds of weird places. We were at the uh, grocery store the other day, and there was a lady there, clearly was wanting to be a man. And it's interesting, isn't it, that women who really want to be men are usually the ones who hate men, right? And then they hate men, so they want to become and look like a man. I mean, it's pretty weird stuff, if you ask me. And, and it doesn't pan out too well. A woman who wants to be a man... 
it's as terrible as a man who wants to be a woman, right? It doesn't play well for it because it isn't God's design. Yeah, you may be deceived by Satan into thinking that, oh, I'm the opposite. I'm going to disagree with God. I'm, going to, I'm better at this than God. I'm going to change God's design. I'm going to change God's plan. We need to be careful. This goes all the way back to the garden. This is why it was a result of what happened there in her reinterpreting the scripture is why we have a war in Ukraine. It was what happened there is why we have death in Houston and all the homicide problems. It was what happened in the garden in Genesis 3 that why we have rapists and pedophiles today. It all fell apart when man chose to go against God, thought they were smarter than God, more righteous than God, more holy than God, better than God, and dismissed God, his plans and purposes and ways, and replaced it with their own thoughts. That's where it went all astray. And in many ways, it was because Satan sounded kind, but only God was kind. So we need to recognize that. Ever since, mankind has been running from God, and that's what Genesis 3 is saying. He says, they heard, okay, so then he says in verse 7, the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden, in the cool of the day. Remember, this is just a sort of a supernatural place where God met with them. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Which when God asks a question, it isn't because he doesn't know the answer. He only asks a question to bring conviction. Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave to be with me. She gave me from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you've done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. When you choose against God, whether you willingly just dismiss the word outright or reinterpret the word, it always causes you to run from God. We understand that when that running from God is, I'm going away from the church, I'm going to get away from my Christian friends, I'm leaving small group, I'm walking away. We understand that rebellion. And that is one of the forms that running from God takes. Another form that rebellion and running from God takes is we spiritualize it. We spiritualize it. We say, oh, well, you know, I'm on a spiritual journey. Oh, what do you mean by that? I don't go to church anymore. Oh, so your spiritual journey is actually a rejection of the word. A lot of times we spiritualize our running from God, and we cloak it in spiritual terms. Well, just following the will of God. Wait a minute, you're following the will of God because I thought you were just telling me you're doing the opposite of what God wants for you. Oh, no, just doing the will of God, just trying to figure out the will of God. Just recently talked to somebody. They're seeing somebody have no participation, nothing to do with the church. This person is actually a follower of Christ, loves the Lord, whatever. And, uh, oh, you're dating. Well, just trying to discern God's will. Oh, that's not even hard. <laughs> it isn't God's will. Wow, that is so binary. Like, that's so legalistic. You don't know that. Oh, yeah, I do know that. I do know that. Because the Bible tells me that you're not to be unequally yoked. In fact, a, a widow is then only to marry in the Lord, it says in the Scriptures. So it may sound binary or unkind, but it's actually kindness towards you from God. You see, a lot of times our running from God is spiritualized. It sounds super spiritual, but it's like you're running as fast as you can away from God using all these spiritual verbiage to keep everyone off your case. Be careful. You and I are tempted to do that. We're tempted to not only reinterpret, but then once reinterpreted, we flee from God, and we can even spiritualize our flight away from God to say that we're pursuing God when we're running the opposite way. Like Jonah, right? If Jonah were a modern Christian, he would say, I'm taking me a spiritual journey. Like, really? Because God said, go that way, and you're going that way. Yep. Just following the will of God. Just really want to be in God's will as he's boarding the boat, right? Wait a minute, because it almost looks like you're going that way. And like God's saying, go that way. Nope. You know, I'm just, just following the Lord. No, no, no. You know, 
and, and people are deceived by that. Wow, they're just following the Lord. Listen, to follow the Lord is to listen to his voice, not Satan's. It's to believe that he's telling you the truth, not Satan. It's to take him at face value and say, if you said it, I believe it, and that settles it, and I'm going to go your way. And you say, well, that has all kinds of consequences. Like, I would have to give up my life if I went that way. And you go, wow, that's crazy, because that sounds just like what Jesus said. My wife told me, man, God told me I should leave my husband. (laughs) Really? That's okay. Is he unrepentantly adulterous? No, but God spoke to me, and he wants my happiness. That's interesting, because he spoke to me, too. It's called the Bible, and in the Bible, he wants your holiness. And in fact, the crazy thing about the Bible, he says, if you practice pursuing holiness, a lot of times, it will be followed by happiness. No, and she divorced her husband, left him. And went somewhere else where the interpretation is, hey, if, if you sense it and you feel it, it must be God. Like, I feel this. You should be able to read the Bible and sense what God's doing in your life. Like, when you read Love Your Enemies, you should, if you have the Holy Spirit, immediately be aware of, like, oh, my goodness, like, I really hate that person. Or, man, I'm really still holding bitterness. And here it's telling me that I should forgive. And I can sense I've got bitterness towards them. And, wow, I need to totally forgive them. You should be able to sense God's leading if you have the Holy Spirit when you're reading the Word of God. But it always goes back to the Word of God because that's why it says test the spirits. There's two spirits that want to be active in your life, just like in Eve's life. What are the two spirits? God's spirit and Satan's spirit. There's only two teams on this thing. So if you're not on God's team, you're on the other team. That's why Jesus, when he rebukes Peter, you're on the other team. You're on Satan's team. Or when he rebukes the Pharisees or Sadducees and he says, you know, your father who? Satan, your father, the devil. Would that have come across really kind to these theologically trained, uh, been to seminary guys, your father, the devil? Would they have appreciated that? Like, oh, man, Jesus, his words are so kind. Was that what they ever thought? No, but was he telling the truth? Yes. And had it awoken them to the severe reality of the direction they were going, would it have been kindness? Yes, sometimes God speaks in very direct ways, and it's part of his kindness to get us to turn and walk his path. So that even today, this morning, the most kind thing that God could do is to awaken you to whatever those things are where you've reinterpreted or denied the scriptures and you're walking away from God. The kindest thing God could do is to get your attention, to hit the brakes and go, man, don't go that way anymore. Go God's way. Like, just agree with him in the Bible. Don't reinterpret it. It isn't really up for interpretation. It's just a statement. And if you just believe it as a statement, like when you read the newspaper, (laughs) say the newspaper, nobody reads the newspaper. Man, I'm getting old. That's what, this is what this gray is. Like I'm getting old and I know the rows always agree with that since I never seem to be up on anything. But the, uh, but if you're reading uh, Fox News, CNN News, whatever this morning, you don't reinterpret it. When it says there's a war and they're surrounding a city in Ukraine, you don't go, I think that's just an emotional battle that some of these ukrainians are facing you actually think no like it's surrounded like they're firing into this town right you don't reinterpret it but when god says it we go you know what let's agree with satan on this this could go anywhere he could say he may mean not eat from that tree Ah, he might mean eat from the tree Ah, and let's just put unity above it and say it really doesn't matter just it's only matters that we're unified some of us eat from the tree some of us don't it only matters unity and God's saying, what? Actually, what matters is that you agree with your maker and that he is right. Because he says, even if every man, even if every man disagrees with him, he will be proved right and every man a liar. So in our own lives, we need to recognize the danger that plunged mankind into this was thinking that Satan, because he sounded kind, was kinder than God who is kind. And you and I face that same temptation. And the temptation is to listen to all these voices that are reinterpreting God's word to say the exact opposite and calling it kindness and labeling it things that, you know, that does sound pretty kind. Be careful. Stay in the word day in and day out. Because in a modern Christianity, we don't know the word. So then all these, what sounds kind from Satan and is actually the opposite, keep destroying our lives. So just as a quick, I dogged everybody for the 
video games, it's easy for me to do because I don't play video games. The fact is all of us enjoy, whether it's golf, fixing cars, video games, whatever it is, all those things we just need to put under the yoke of God is supreme, God is sovereign, even our entertainment, and it's okay to have an, some entertainment, right? They just all have to be within the confines of Jesus is Lord, my time is short, and I am here to promote his kingdom. And yes, we can enjoy things, including video games, in case Daniel's really into video games, don't know. But, and we do uh, things as well. But all that to say, be very, very careful and don't think to yourself to say, I would never be deceived. I could be. I would be in a heartbeat. If I don't stay in the word and I thought God's spirit, if I don't keep listening to God's spirit, I'll be totally deceived. And you would too. And we need to recognize our utter dependence on God every day. Like if you woke up today, it was only because of God's kindness and you're completely and fully dependent on his mercy and grace today. Fully. And it, 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 but for the grace of God, there go we. We go off in all these things. So we're, we don't have enemies because they believe differently. We have compassion because they've been deceived and recognition that we could go that same way. So let's pray. Father, we come before you recognizing that we don't even see the errors in our life or the ways we've been deceived into believing what sounds kind but actually isn't kind because it isn't consistent with your word. I pray right now in your spirit that you would move in our lives. If there are ways we're deceiving ourselves, if there are ways we're reinterpreting the Bible instead of just believing the Bible, I pray that you'd convict us, that you would expose those in our minds right now, that we would be quick to repent and turn from those things and follow after you, believing that everything you've said is true, it's perfect, it's pure, it will lead to our flourishing, that actually your kindness, when you speak about redeeming us and you speak about forgiving us and you speak about directing us and protecting us and providing for us, not only now but for eternity, you're speaking truth. You love us. You made us, and you want us to walk with you. And we're thankful that you made a way, Jesus, through the cross, that your death, burial, and resurrection covered our sin. By your life, we now have life. And because you rose from the grave, we will one day rise from the grave as well and go to be with you because you said it, and everything you say comes true. And so we thank you in advance, and we look forward to meeting you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.